Hello and welcome back to the show. And today there are two major talking points of major market events that have happened this week, which is that namely of US CPI and also the latest Federal Reserve interest rate announcement. So that's what's on the agenda and we're going to break it down. Um, for any of those more regular listeners, you can probably hear uh, either I'm a very fit individual and I can cycle a bike and sound very cool, cool and calm and collected. But uh, I'm going to use the excuse of we couldn't fit the Watt bike into our recording studio. <laughs> and so therefore, Piers and I were both on the bike at 7 a.m. this morning. Uh, how many how many k kilometers right. did you clock in? I knocked out 31 k's before 8.50. You know. Okay, I shouldn't have just, asked that because that makes me sound bad now because I, I only did 20. <laughs> it's just my usual morning, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, for anyone who's, who's listening for the first time, we, we, we've, um, we're doing an event, raising money for Great Ormond Street. Uh, they're building a new cancer care unit for children. And we've got, we, we're doing this uh, Ride Across America Challenge. And so, yeah, if you want to donate, that would be amazing. I'll drop a, a link in the, in the show notes, but yeah, everyone's got stuck in and we're doing the best we can to keep pace with uh world record holder, James Golding, who's doing this in real life. I think he's currently, I understand cycling through the grand Canyon at the moment. So definitely a little bit high, harder than what we're doing for sure. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about the data points. And the thing, the way I wanted to frame this episode was um, break down what exactly happened. So let's talk about the data in itself and uh, we can talk about the macro implication from the Fed perspective, dot plots and all that good stuff. But then also I wanted to talk a little bit about how you as a trader would interact with this type of information and, and talk me through a little bit of your uh, experience from doing that, good and bad. And maybe that can help unpack a little bit the different roles in finance and how different market participants interact with these news-driven events in particular so yeah let's kick it off with um with us cpi yeah so i mean big news of course i mean this data is the number one piece of information that economists traders investors you name it are looking out for each month and that's just because it's the critical economic measure that the fed are looking at when they're deciding on when to hit the button on beginning their rate cutting cycle and of course um, but the backstory being that inflation has been stubborn in coming back down to the Fed's 2% target. Um, we had expected it to be down at 2% already, and it just hasn't happened. And so as the months roll on with inflation staying stubbornly high, then the Fed have had to push out their rate cutting cycle, right? So that's the kind of context. And so each month we're all desperately waiting, you know, please come down inflation, please come down inflation so that the Fed can start cutting. And every month this year, we've been disappointed until this week. So I would say the, the inflation data, which hit the wires yesterday, we're recording this on Thursday. So um, Wednesday, the 12th, 1.30 p.m. is when the inflation numbers, and there's many numbers in this inflation report, they all hit the headlines. And markets sprung to the upside and that's because this is definitely i would say the most encouraging inflation report of the whole year so far um the numbers so the headline uh, cpi reading year on year was 3.3 percent now that's lower than the expected 3.4 percent so lower than the than expected all right tick that's that's what we want to see. Uh, I think with that headline reading, though, that's about as where the good news ends because it's lower than expected at three point three percent. But it's still like if you look back over the last two, well, certainly twelve months, that headline reading, um, it's been sideways in a range between three percent and three point seven percent. So actually, this three point three percent reading is just bang in the middle of this range. So if all you looked at was the headline year-on-year -year CPI chart, you'd think that inflation is going sideways, not down, okay? But when you start looking at some of the other numbers, so if you look at then more shorter term, so we, all, we also look at inflation, what's called month-on-month. -month. 
So that headline year on year, that means prices, you know, in the month of May 2024 versus prices in the month of May 2023. Okay. And three and prices are 3.3 percent higher. But if you look month on month, it's looking much more shorter term. And so if you want to look at a guide towards, you know, inflationary trends in the short term, then you look at that shorter reading. Month on month then is May versus April, right? And there we had a, this is the really one of the key points of this whole report. There it was zero, zero percent. So no inflation. So actually prices in May were the same as they were in April. And the reason why that is significant is because that's the first reading we've had at zero since July 2022. And actually, July 2022, it was zero. And actually, if you take that, they're the only two zero readings in the entire four-year period since COVID. So this is like matching a four-year low for month-on-month inflation. So if you're out there praying and hoping that the overall inflation picture is going to start to decline back to the Fed's target, then that's a really encouraging uh, piece of information. Then, so that's like the headline stuff. That includes food and energy and everything's bunged in there, right? But then we look at, and the Fed are more interested as well, at looking at what's called the core inflation. So this is then stripping out food and energy, the volatile stuff, and looking more at the services side of the economy where the pricing is much more driven by consumer spending and consumer demand. And so there, the figures were really encouraging. So the headline year-on-year reading was 3.4%. Now, that's higher than the overall CPI reading of 3.3, but it's all about trend and movement compared to recent months. And the, the key thing there is that we've had now two declines. So March was 3.8%, right? We had then a 0.2% decline in April to 3.6. We've had another 0.2% decline to 3.4. And when you look at the kind of annual chart of all of this, it looks like the decline is picking up speed. Okay. And that's kind of, the, that's the key here. It's it's trend and looking at how does this number compare to the previous months and which direction are we heading in and how fast and so right now, the core chart is looking like the downside is picking up speed. Um, and then you can delve into it in more detail. Um, and if you look at something called called the sort of, um, well, the good thing about that headline inflation, core inflation number dropping, it was not driven by the housing services inflation component. It was not. It's that component that's been stubbornly high for various reasons. And everyone's been thinking, well, as soon as that housing figure starts to come down, well, the whole inflation picture will decline. But actually here you've got the whole inflation picture declining without the housing market moving. And so actually this is stuff like airfares, car insurance, repairs, hotels, clothes, all this stuff. Um, which is a pretty broad spectrum of consumer items. All of it is coming, you know, it is helping to bring this um, number lower. And so the what we call the services inflation X housing was zero in May. And so ultimately, as I said, long story short, this is the best inflation report the whole year. And maybe, just maybe, we might start to see inflation now heading down towards 2% over the course of the next few months. So would you suggest for a student is a sensible thing to do to go on the BLS website and look at the CPI report? Because the way you've articulated what you've said, is that what you'd be expecting as a student to be able to articulate when you talk about US CPI over and above just saying it's gone down? it was more moderate it's moderating or how far how far of a knowledge do you need to go to i guess secure a role in finance in your early career if i was interviewing someone i'd put people in three categories if i asked them a question about the us inflation report i think there'd generally be three categories number one they've got no idea 
Oh, what? There was inflation data? Okay, I didn't I didn't know, sorry. Okay. They're not hired, for sure. Number two, it's right, yes, I saw that inflation dropped and you know it seemed to be a really positive thing for markets. Right? That's superficial. I mean, that's superficial level knowledge. That's better than no knowledge, but it's superficial in so much as you could scan the front page of the MFT and capture that because it's in the headline, right? Those that can then go further and talk about core CPI and talk about month on month versus year on year, those that can delve in and start talking about services, inflation, X housing. Okay. They're the ones that have taken the time to really read the articles and from various sources. And, you know, I want people to be reading an article in the FT, which is quite top level, and then pick out a couple of things. Oh, services, inflation, X housing. All right, let's drill down into that. Let me Google that. Let me see where I can find some more detailed information about that on the BLS website or whatever it might be. Then they're the candidates, right, that uh, are able to demonstrate that they really – they're fascinated by this stuff. They find it really interesting so that they want to seek out and spend time reading up on it. And they're the people you want working for you in the roles where that kind of thing is important because you want people who are passionate and interested in mm. in the role. Yeah. And just to kind of connect the dots, I did see, I think, the Goldman's summer internship kicked off on Monday. Mm. And they put a like a marketing piece out. And it was like they had 315,000 applications. And this is this is how many people got the job. And it calculated that the acceptance rate was about 0.8%, which to put into context, that's obviously very small. I think Citadel is 0.3% as mm. a reference point. So it's incredibly hard to get into Goldman's. It's even harder to get into some other places. But the point being is what you've described is definitely possible and I think when you're fighting those odds, it's probably because what you just said on the third category, mm. you'd, you'd probably, well, I would say there's probably is only about 1% who could probably describe it to that level. Probably, but I don't think it takes long. Well, hang on, there's kind of two things. It doesn't take long, like for me to kind of read up on on the report in that level of detail that I've just talked about. You could go way deeper, by the way. Mm. Um, to that level of detail I went to, I don't know. You could capture all of that. You could you could spend 10 minutes on it and get to that. Now, that's because I've done it a lot in the past in that I know what I'm looking for, right? So this is where it comes. If you're a student and you delve into this stuff every month, and like if this is the sixth time you've done it, the sixth month that you've really delved into it, then for you, it will start to become mm. much quicker, much more second nature, and you can spend 10 minutes, bang, done, great, now I'm up to speed. Mm. walk into an interview be confident in talking about it yeah um, this is what i was explaining to our interns who are with us at the moment on our, our summer program it's preparation observation and review and yeah. repetition and then it becomes habitual then you become fluent and every meeting you see it's like it just builds out that knowledge bank but that's why yeah the superficial will get you so far but the real understanding when then you can articulate it in a believable manner that demonstrates passion and yeah. interest, then you need, you can't just, um, you know, reel it off. You've got to be in it um, right. consistently. And then I would go another step, right? So you, you're reading up on the data, then it's like, right, how did markets react? Mm. So, you know, if we looked at that, I mean, it really was, I mean, it was genuinely, you know, a straight up really big market event, this um, go back and have a look at your charts, 1.30 p.m. yesterday on Wednesday. And so we had big, big reaction across the asset classes. So you had stocks, you know, surging to the upside. And that's because, remember then, this inflation report was really good in so much as it, it, inflation's dropped. And so people are then getting more excited about, well, maybe the Fed can cut in September, Right. And maybe we, we will get two or, ooh, I don't know, maybe even three cuts before the end of the year, right? That's the optimists. And so stocks go up through the roof, which makes sense. Um, looking at the other asset classes, though, I mean, so it's talking about stocks is the obvious asset class you'd probably gravitate towards. But what's really impressive 
in an interview scenario, if you can then go and talk about the other asset classes as well. So if you look at the kind of US government bond situation, then um, bond yields dropped. That's because then our interest rate expectations are lower. We're expecting maybe more cuts. So bond yields drop, bond prices spike higher. And then you look at the dollar and the dollar's value dropped. Okay, so the dollar devalued, again, pricing in some, you know, uh, more interest rate cuts in 2024 than we had thought prior to this data being announced. Okay, so let, let, let's move on then, because as you said, that was a few hours before. <laughs> it was like Super Wednesday. Um, and a few hours later, then the Fed come out. And one of the main things that people were looking at with the Fed was no one was expecting an interest rate change in this meeting which didn't materialize. So rate's still five and a quarter, five and a half percent range. However, there was like this ultra focus and sensitivity towards the dot plot, which is this projections the Fed put out on a quarterly basis about their future forecasts of where interest rates will be at the end of the year. Um, and the summary of that was in the last two meetings, the projections going back to March and DEC had projected three cuts for 2024. Um, and they moved that to one. Now, I don't find it that much of a surprise to think they've moved from three to one, given the economic situation that we we now know from the previous weeks. However, from a market reaction perspective, do you think it the the movement that we saw, which perhaps you can go on to explain, but do you think it was a little bit of a function of, because I saw what markets are priced in for cuts, for this year after the CPI. So in the immediate aftermath, we had gone from thinking they would do one to two. Yeah. And then the Fed come out a couple hours later and officially put on the table one. So did that determine the initial knee jerk move? And there's obviously other things we can discuss on the, the presser and the details, but was that that initial is a function of yeah. the pricing that occurred in the period? If you're in, this is what we call the fast money. Mm. Right, so this is short-term, uh, intraday market participants, and and you know intraday that could be a human being placing trades manually, you know, right down to high-frequency, you know, algorithmic trading systems or placing trades in microsecond got a kind of time frames, right? Um, so there you've got people that aren't looking or they're not thinking about medium to long term then they're, they're not you know the mindset is not you know when will the fed actually start cutting you know how many rate cuts might we have this year you know how big might the cutting cycle be overall you know what might rates be at the bottom of the cut, next cutting cycle in 12 24 months you know they're not really thinking like that all they're thinking about is today how is price going to behave given the new informational inputs on that day? And so when it comes to Fed stuff, well, firstly, when it comes to inflation or any economic data of importance, right, that's information being announced. Bang. Right. Is it? I mean, it's quite binary. Well, often it's binary. So it's either good or bad. You buy or sell, right? And you're thinking short-term reaction here. Let's get in and out over the space of a few seconds or minutes or hours, depending on your intraday kind of time frame. Um, I, I hesitated when I said binary. The thing is, sometimes it's a bit complicated when you get lots of information announced at the same time. Like we did with the inflation report, there's lots of different numbers. And sometimes and quite often you can get the numbers conflicting. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and then it can get a bit messy. What was good about yesterday's report, all of the numbers all lent that one same direction, which was, hang on, inflation's dropping faster than we thought. Yeah, and, and, and kind of one thing I saw, which was there's a, a tool called the Fed Statement Tracker. Ah, yeah. So it automatically will update when they drop it and it's from the wall street journal it just kind of eradicates out a removal and puts in the replacement word and it was literally two words that were removed because these statements tend to see very little alteration uh, meeting by meeting because the fed don't want to create instability they don't want to shake things up dramatically not unless there was a big event in markets they'd need to 
adapt to. Continuity is key. So check out this sentence then, first paragraph, and it's on inflation, which is obviously, as you said earlier, the critical component to ascertain what is the Fed going to do in the future. So the previous statement on 1st of May, they said, in recent months, there has been a lack of further progress toward the committee's 2% inflation objective. The only word change in the statement was, was essentially they've got rid of a lack of, and it now says, in recent months, there has been modest further progress towards the committee's 2% inflation objective. Would that not be counterintuitive then to the initial knee-jerk response of the dots and the reaction function of, oh, this is hawkish, stocks decline, but actually they're acknowledging here that inflation is moving closer yeah. to target. So, so again, it depends who you are. If you're a short-term intraday trader, this is hawkish. Sell stocks, buy the dollar, you know, get get short T notes, right? Because the moves off the inflation data from that afternoon are now going to get reversed, all right? Get in, there's going to be a short-term knee-jerk reaction in a, in a binary sense to how this report is being interpreted, okay? Now then you move beyond that and you think, well, come on. You know, the thing is, right, the Fed have been... Um, conservative all year, whereby we've had higher than expected inflation, right, generally speaking. But have the Fed, are they hiking rates? No. The Fed are just not cutting. Okay, so they're, they're not hiking where you could say, take any one of those months in isolation where inflation's gone up, you could say, Oof, well, shouldn't the Fed start hiking here? But the thing is, they're not looking at one month or even two months. They're kind of looking at three months at least of data and, and a trend. And then they might start making some decisions. So they've been conservative all year because they haven't hiked in the face of inflation maybe ticking back up. And here, it's the opposite. They're being conservative in what now looks like inflation ticking back down. And they're right to be conservative because inflation has been basically impossible to predict. We thought it was going to drop and it didn't. Then we thought, well, it's not dropping and now it has. <laughs> so it's like, well, who the hell knows, right? And so from the Fed's point of view, are they going to cut in September? Well, that's, well, hang on, correct me if I'm wrong. There's another meeting, isn't there, which will be at July. the start, yeah, in end, end of, of July. July. Yeah. Then definitely not going to cut then, right? Now, September, I mean, look, by then, that'll be, when will it be? Mid-September. I'm actually not quite sure if we'll get the August inflation report before that September meeting or not. But let's just say the June inflation data and the July inflation data are similar to the May inflation data we got yesterday, where it shows a continued decline. If they get three months of solid data in a row where inflation's dropping, then maybe there's an outside bet that they might cut in September. I would say more likely they're going to be conservative and not do that, and they'll probably wait, much to Biden's annoyance. Biden would love a little cheeky rate cut pre-election. I don't think he's going to get it. Um, and so, look, they're being conservative. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say generally, I mean, look, if you look at the stock market, right now it's quite an interesting uh reaction ultimately because the nasdaq let's just take the nasdaq jumped higher off the back of the inflation data fine there was then some real noise and it went lower off the fed announcement but actually it closed the session and actually overnight i should say really sorry in overnight trade it's now higher than it was it's higher than yesterday's high so that that negative reaction off the Fed has been eradicated and we're back up on the top. So from a stock market point of view, stocks are now looking a bit further down the line and they're saying, yeah, it's only one low inflation number. I get why the Fed have stayed pat and been, you know, saying, look, we're not getting carried away. We're not cutting. We're not cutting. You know, it makes sense. But if your view is that inflation is now really starting to drop, then you'll predict that the Fed will move towards a cut 
if those June and July inflation reports come in similar. So you're starting to make that bet as as a kind of more medium term view. Mm. Is there any of these meetings over the your career that you think particularly stuck out in your mind and perhaps walk me through the mechanics of what how you traded that event but also it'd be great to get an insight of how i mean because you were uh, at the time day trading in terms of intraday very short term so it was the former it's more of the the knee jerk yeah um taking advantage of these mispricing in markets and things like that so talk me through that and then i'd also like to know like a lot of the students I was talking to have never done anything like this before. And so whilst they're learning and they're learning and winning and losing, <laughs> um, how do you emotionally handle this in terms of gearing up for a big event? Mm. It's kind of like, right, the Olympic Games comes every four years and you're like, you train, you train. You've got literally, there's 9.4 seconds for you to win the gold sort of thing. And don't mess it up because you've got to wait four years. So is there like almost you get these big events which are scheduled and you're like, this is going to be a big one. So how do you contain that nat natural kind of irrationality that could lead to impulsive behavior? And yeah. How do you then come out of that high focused level of concentration and with really good or really bad outcomes? Like emotionally, you're probably somewhere on the outer spectrum of your normal emotional variants how do you pull yourself back in post a big event yeah the, i mean these days where there's a big set piece event like the fed yeah there's a there's just a different atmosphere on the floor and there's a real uh, sort of buzz of expectation and anticipation and excitement and you know your mindset is well look this is what i've been training for this is what i've been preparing for this is it this is the moment i wouldn't quite say it's like the olympics because the feds every six weeks right so it's more like i i would call it more like a uh, i don't know just using sporting analogies still it, it might be that you know it's an important it's like a top of the table clash or you know if you're talking premier league here if you're man city then, right, it's a game against one of your rivals, you know, the other kind of top four clubs, which comes along every, maybe every six weeks, right? And it's like, it's that one where you know it's really key. The pressure's on, the expectation is high. Your personal desire is, right, this should be a big event. This should or could lead to a lot of market movement. That means if, I'm on it, I can perform at a really high level here. And when you're thinking very personally about your P&L, you're thinking, right, I could make, you know, I could make a big chunk of my monthly P&L off this one event. I mean, you know, if you've got a really good meeting, you could easily make half of your month's P&L in that one session. So when you're going into that session, your personal expectations are very high. You're hoping it's going to be a really big one, right? Now, that's super dangerous because if you allow your hope to override, then naturally your brain will have bias and it will naturally, I would say, take the information that gets announced. And because you're hoping for it to be sensational and really unexpected and it's going to drive a big market movement, you might have a bias towards the parts of the information that are different and a bit more unexpected. And you might latch onto those and you might kind of subconsciously ignore the information that actually that's what we thought was going to happen. You kind of discount that and you, and you, you tra you, you're over aggressive and you're looking to trade a move that just isn't there. Now, that's super dangerous because you end up, you can lose a lot of money in these events if you're trading it in a way that's in your head rather than in reality. So the best traders, you know, you talk, and again, talking about sport analogies, but you talk about, you know, athletes being in the zone, right? How can you perform at your absolute optimum 
when the pressure is also at its absolute peak. And because the pressure is at its peak, well, that's the hardest moment to perform, right? Talk, talk me through, I want to know your routine because I yeah. know there's usually a template that professional athletes will have. I want to know mm. what was your routine? Um, I wouldn't really, t- I wouldn't really get involved with the, the banter and the chat on the floor. You know, everyone's buzzing around. My God, yeah. What do you think is going to happen? Right. You know, you know, th- that's where the kind of the emotional stuff bubbles up. I kind of would, you know, I'd kind of stick to myself, sit at my desk, wouldn't really engage with that kind of stuff. And I'm just kind of right waiting but then the the real skill is when the information hits because yeah fine your half of your brain's desperate right i want a big move and i want to make a big pnl but you've got to really be in the present where you've got to say okay what is the information and then be quite very pragmatic about it and i guess pragmatism is probably one of my strengths so it's pragmatic about right that's the information okay what am i going to do with that and it's not that half of the brain that wishes there's going to be a big move, it's like, actually, we'll take it on merit. Is that information surprising or not? In which direction? And right, how big a move do I expect based on the information? And I'm going to trade the information rather than my desire to to kind of make, make money. Um, and I guess, I don't know, there's been certainly occasions where I've made a lot of money on these monetary policy meetings. I've definitely lost a lot of money as well i mean that's how i learned to be more pragmatic and rational you know it came from painful events where i allowed the emotional side to override and got slapped down and once you get that almost like mental scarring but that's when you really really learn right and then you don't do it again because you've got that pain scenario to kind of keep your emotions in check but like the, I, I remember the, probably the best monetary policy meeting i had from a trading point of view was when there was a really big surprise like last night's meeting was a very very small surprise very tiny right where the fed were a bit more hawkish than people wanted them to be given the low inflation announced a few hours earlier right tiny surprise um my best meeting was a big surprise. So this it was November 2008, actually, showing my age a bit here. But um, what hopefully listeners will realize is that October 2008 was a pretty key month for the planet because that's when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and the great financial crisis you know, really kicked in and everything fell off a cliff. Um, then we got central banks and the more aggressive central banks really starting to step up and take action. And we were going into a, it was a Bank of England meeting and the Bank of England were before the Fed. So actually it was the first kind of major central bank and people were expecting the Bank of England to cut, cut rates. And I think, I can't remember exactly what was expected. It might have been a half a point cut or maybe it was even 1% cut. Yeah, I think it was one. Right, and people were going, 1% cut is huge right? Then banks never shift rates by that much in one meeting. And so everyone's going, look, the Bank of England are going to be super aggressive here. They're going to cut by 1%. Okay. That was in everyone's mind. The news came and they cut by 1.75%. And it was like, bloody hell, wow. On the one hand, it was, Jesus, okay, this is, this crisis is way worse than we thought then given how ultra aggressive this um, move is by the central bank. So, I mean, markets just went mental um, and it was really hard to trade because there's this thing called liquidity. Uh, I don't want to go too far into this, but ultimately if you want, so I was trade like the most sensitive product to interest rate changes and changes in interest rate expectations, I would say is the two year government bond. OK, that's that that duration is the kind of most sensitive to uh, interest rates. So and it just so happens that that was I was a specialist two year government bond trader. I mean, that was literally my product. And so um, it's the best product to be trading when central banks make 
moves. So, but so here, if they cut by more, then fine. Yields are going to go down by more. Prices are going to go up. So I wanted to buy, right? Now the, that's fine. You want to buy, but to buy, you need a seller. There has to be a counterparty. But the problem is, who the hell's going to sell when the Bank of England have just cut by way more than expected? So therein lies your problem. Now, I would put this down as my probably one of my literally best ever trades because there was nothing, there was no liquidity on the sell side of the book. So we would sit with our screens and we'd have the entire, well, obviously the height of your computer screen allows visibility on a certain portion of the order book, okay? And there were no sell orders at all, like none. So I can't buy then, can I? But I just scrolled up a little bit. Mm. And then there were some sell orders. People have maybe left orders in by mistake or something, but they were miles above where the market had been trading before the announcement. But I went, you know what? That's miles above market, but I think this market's going to go 10 miles above. But it took a certain amount of um, confidence, maybe a bit of bravery, to go, you know, I'm going to lift your offer a mile above market because I think it's going 10 miles. That bit. It was aggressive, so I, I bought it. I took out all the orders on a portion of the order book and got a big size on. Actually, it wasn't that big, so there wasn't much liquidity, but then it went four times. Um, and so, and then I got out, and it was a great trade. Um, so it took a rational judgment, but then I think most people wouldn't have executed it because you needed to buy way above where the market was previously trading. And I think that that's the that's the best part of the trade from when I self-analyze it back. How do you decompress after that? So you are with the other people on the floor. Some people would have lost money. Some people would have made some money. You've then got like, so there's the peer group, but then there's the management structure looking at you as well. And they know your P&L quite clearly. And then you leave that trading floor and you go home. Yeah. <laughs> so so talk, talk me through the floor first and then the home. Like, well, how, do you, how do you to kind of like, well, first of all, how did you feel immediately after that situation? Do you, is it like a feeling of um, cool and calm? Because that's exactly what I thought would happen. It's happened. Or is it more, you feel that, euphoria and then you control it yeah i mean i'd like to say i was cool and calm but i wasn't i mean <laughs> you know when you when you when you hit one of your best ever trades you know it's like it's like i don't know scoring a goal like, like top corner from 30 yards you know in the cup final type moment where you're not just gonna casually walk back to the halfway line you're going to be running around taking your shirt off jumping in the crowd but I mean, I, I, that's how I felt inside. I didn't really show my emotions externally. And I think to, a, to an extent, yeah, you don't know what other people have done. You don't know how they've got on. You don't want to be celebrating running down the trading floor when other people are hurting and have lost money. So I, would, I wouldn't really talk. I wouldn't really announce that I'd done a, an amazing trade. or So I would just... But inside, I'm celebrating, right? <laughs> and you're really, yeah, your your adrenaline's up. And then again, from experience, the best policy is just to turn everything off. Because if you start to trade afterwards, you often fall into that trap of thinking you can do another one of those. You know, you then your expectations become wildly, you know, beyond reality. That one single trade off the in the moment was the trade. If you expect another trade of another size, same size again, forget it, because markets then start to calm down, it can often get very noisy, and you can often lose half of the money you've made if you carry on trying. So I yeah, one trade in, out, done, switch it off. If then there might be a couple of other people who have nailed it as well. So then you're like, all right. Let's get out. Let's get out of the office and 
go and debrief um, over a, you know, cold beverage, cold beverage or two. <laughs> uh, um, and then you'd be joined by those probably later that got got it wrong. Um, and they're kind of more drowning their sorrows. Um, but yeah, it's certainly internally, you're really buzzing. And so. And good. then how, how do you manage a, um, you know, because a lot of the jobs in finance, you, you close a big funding round, you execute a deal, you win a, a tender, or you do a trade or so. So how do you manage that relationship then at home when you get home? I mean, a natural reaction you would imagine in a human relationship is to go, oh, I had this amazing news to tell you. Like today was, <laughs> but then I mean, trading, I'm surely that doesn't compute on most, yeah. with most people. Yeah, that's it. I think it's hard to relate if you're not, you know, if, if you're not a trader, I think it's really difficult to relate to what it's like emotionally um, when it's good and when it's bad. Um but, you know, you can measure it in terms that are understandable in that, you know, that was my best ever day or my one of my best ever days. And like when you've been trading, I think by that point, I've been trading for six years. And so if it was one of my best ever days, you know, in, in six, six years, that's like 2000 days. Right. Then obviously that gives some sense of of the magnitude of it. But then, you know. Uh, I had a 20 month old daughter and um, she just needed a nappy changing <laughs> so that's what she thought about it <laughs> you know so you kind of get you kind of get grounded pretty rapidly so, that, so yeah okay so you're saying that the key to success is uh, <laughs> have a have a uh, a, a little human around to be the ultimate distraction oh, well, that and is then everything else right. pales in significance to raising a child that's right <laughs> well, yeah i can only sympathize with that i'm just doing uh, my bit for the uh for the uk birth rate <laughs> come on guys okay cool well look great to get a bit of um you know a bit of uh, inside the head of piers curran and uh it's always good to hear these things because i think you know you don't hear you don't hear about this sort of stuff a great deal. And perhaps, you know, if you uh, want to hear more of that on the show, I mean, I mean, it doesn't have to be from peers always. I'm sure I've got, you know, a few, few tales to tell and I, we can get other people on similar who've had experience in different uh, industries. Then yeah, if you find it useful, let us know, drop a, drop a comment. Um, certainly on Spotify, I know there's that option, but yeah, otherwise we'll wrap it up there. Thank you, peers. And uh, so hopefully that was a, an interesting episode to just get get under the bonnet a little bit about data, how it works and, and how it would be traded in reality. And we will see you next week. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. See you later.